we have 20 minutes or so, and we can go a little over time because we have then. Okay, 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 good. Okay, so welcome to, uh, back after our lunch break. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Greta Krippner, uh, who is uh, a professor of sociology at the University of Michigan, uh, focusing in the field of historical sociology. Uh, Greta has a keen interest in the interrelation between economic sociology, political uh, uh, economy, historical uh, sociology, and also uh, is one of the uh, economic sociologists who has also an interest in the development of theoretical uh, concepts. I just remind of uh, one debate in which you were um, prominently involved, namely uh, on uh, the question of what is actually the significance of the notion of embeddedness in Karl Polanyi. And uh, Greta Krippner made the um, uh, uh, correct and important point that uh, embeddedness is not, uh, does not equal in, uh, uh, social networks, yeah, but is uh, in the work of Polanyi, of course, much more yeah, and uh, the institutional set of, of, a, uh, of a macro economy. Uh, in 2012, um, Greta uh, published uh, her uh, book, Capitalizing uh, on Crisis, the Political Origins of the Rise uh, of Finance, which is really one of the, I think, most important uh, publications uh, dealing with uh, processes uh, of financialization. And uh, currently she is working uh, on another book project, which is on the evolution of risk concepts in uh, 20th uh, century uh, American uh, political economy and how actually the, um, the uh, political understanding uh, of risk, social understanding of risk, became more and more individualized uh, in the course uh, of the uh, 20th century. Her talk today is entitled The Fictitious Economy, Marx on Credit, Finance, and Financialization. It's a pleasure having you here. So thank you, Jens, for that uh, very substantive uh, and generous introduction. Uh, and thank, uh, thanks to, to you and to Wolfgang for inviting me. This was a birthday party I did not want to miss. So it's, uh, it's customary to begin any treatment of Marx by extolling the difficulties of one's task. And since my assignment was to write on money and credit, I feel uh, especially entitled to do so. Uh, among the particular challenges I wish to note First, the status of uh, money in Marx's overall account is difficult to determine. While the notion that Marx viewed money as secondary or peripheral has been firmly rejected by a number of knowledgeable commentators, some version of this thesis continually resurfaces. Marx himself frequently gave voice to sentiments that could lead one to conclude that money is of secondary importance in his theory as well as in the overall, uh, as, as well as in the actual workings of capitalist economies, although the sheer number of pages devoted to explicating the forms and functions of money might give one pause here. A related difficulty is the unconventional manner in which Marx deploys concepts that are central to his analysis, concepts such as the commodity, money, value, capital, concepts we've already been discussing uh, here at this uh, conference. As uh, Ullman has argued, Marxian concepts rest on an, <clears throat> on an ontology of inner relations rather than external causation. Uh, in other words, a concept such as money is not neatly bounded in Marx's analysis, but intermittently, intermittently expresses other concepts as moments in its own development. Thus, for example, money is, both is and is not capital. Accordingly, the status we give uh, to money in Marx's account depends on which moment we are prioritizing in the analysis. Third, uh, Marx's influential treatment of capital retains the Hegelian formulations that he largely casts aside in his mature economic writings more generally. It's often been observed that the first four chapters of capital that deal with money and circulation 
form the most difficult section of the work, and this is an assessment with which I fully concur. Fourth, uh, Marx's observations on credit, banking, and financial markets presented in volume three of Capital consist of a fragmentary compilation of his reading notes and unfinished commentaries. And notably, Engels' attempts to impose order on this material uh, apparently did not improve it. So we're left with a collection of observations that, however illuminating on particular questions, constitute nothing like a full theory of money. And finally, uh, while Marx's uh, writings on money and credit contain many observations that are remarkably forward-looking and even prescient, and those are elements I'll try to draw out in my talk today, uh, his analysis is bounded by his own <laughs> historical moment. And there is inevitably an archaic feel to some, to some aspects of this work. So for example, Marx found it difficult to envision a monetary system that did not rest on metal. And as such, some, of, some work has to be done to translate his observations into the 21st century of paper and digital currencies. However arduous the task, I believe that a reconsideration of Marx's views on money and credit is well worth the effort. Indeed, what strikes me upon rereading te Marx's key texts is how fresh and vigorous many of, his, many of his insights on money and credit are, and how well they apply to contemporary capitalism. Marx saw be, be, beyond the earliest stirrings of uh, finance capital in the 19th century to peer towards 21st century financialization. He understood the paradoxical role of credit in stabilizing value production while also serving as the mother of every insane form. Most fundamentally, Marx, Marx grasped money as a form of fetishism, a social relationship that disguised and legitimated the exercise of social power. Instead of treating Marx's theory of money and credit as secondary or peripheral within his broader analysis of capitalism then, uh, in this paper I will place money and credit firmly at the center of Marx's account. Doing so, I suggest, produced important insights both into Marx's overarching project and into the workings of contemporary capitalist economies. As for the former, uh, foregrounding Marx's writings on uh, money and credit makes clear how deeply rooted Marx's political economy, including his mature political, his mature political economy, is in his theory of alienation. Marx's theory of alienation, in turn, provides the key to understanding contemporary financialized capitalism and ways that help to explain why this system is so subject to mystification and also so prone to crisis. In this regard, I will argue not only that Marx's insights hold up well under current conditions, itself a notable achievement given that he produced his major economic writings 150 years ago, but that his account actually improves upon, uh, on, uh, actually improves upon uh, prevalent contemporary theories of the recurrent crises that are characteristic of capitalism in its financialized form. So in my comments today, uh, I will examine how Marx's theory of money, read through his concept of alienation, provides a compelling account of the nature of financial crises under, fi under financialization. And then I'll discuss precisely how money and credit uh, and finance more broadly ac acquire a kind of mystical power over individuals, an important <coughs> aspect uh, particularly of financialized capitalism. But a preliminary task here is to establish the warrant for this approach by first, appro uh, by first elaborating on the close relationship between Marx's theory of money and his theory of alienation. So this is the task with which I will begin. Money, Marx writes, is the corporate sensuous existence of alienation. That money is an object that deeply expresses the experience of alienation under capitalism is a recurrent theme in Marx's early writings and in somewhat more veiled form is present in his mature uh, political economy as well. Of course, the concept of alienation is arguably the connecting thread that runs through Marx's various analyses of life under capitalism. Alienation is expressed in politics, the state, religion, the family, and other sites. And as such, it would be quite surprising if alienation didn't also inflect money. But money's relationship to alienation is arguably more fundamental than these other manifestations. Consider the analysis that Marx puts forward in his spectacular and yet curiously neglected essay written in 1844 on James Mill. This is an essay that, in my view, offers the key to Marx's entire analysis on, of money and credit. Given private property as the framework for exchange, Marx argues in this essay that money is a mediator, an object that serves to move private property from one individual to another. As mediator, Marx tells us, money expresses no human relationship. It is the abstract relationship of private property to private property, an abstraction from its specific personal nature. The notion that money tears private property out of its particular and specific relationship to the producer is critical to understanding Marx's meaning here. 
The producer fashioning a product responds to nothing but his internal need. The product expresses his individuality, and he remakes himself in it. But insofar as each, indiv each individual comes into contact with others who also produce, he experiences a, new, a need for products he has not directly fabricated. As Marx writes, the other man is also the owner of another thing, which I lack, but which I neither can nor will dispense with, and which I need to complete my own existence and to realize my own existence. This need initially constitutes a social bond that unites the two, on, that unites the two owners, for each desires what the other has. As Marx elaborates, the longing for these two objects, the need for them, shows each owner makes him conscious of the fact that he stands in another essential relation to the objects than that of private property, that he is not the particular being as he imagines, but a total being, and as a total being, his needs stand in an inner relation to the products and labor of others. For the felt need for a thing is the most obvious, irrefutable proof that the thing is part of my essence, that its being is for me, and that its property is the particular quality peculiar to my essence. However, the desire to possess what the other has compels the mutual alienation of each producer's property, with the result that this total being is immediately lost. Now private property has become alienated private property. No longer does the product express each individual's full personhood, but instead reflects a two-sided process of fragmentation and division. On the one side, the producer has transferred his product the result of his, of his exclusive distinguishing personality to another who has not produced it and for whom it has no personal significance. On the other side, one product has been exchanged for another product, hence treated as equivalent, its unique properties extinguished in this exchange. For Marx, the experience of alienation refers to the loss of a specific personal identity that connects the individual to a social whole, the constitution, in, in other words, of man as a purely abstract being. And we now see why money is necessarily implicated in this process. When private property is exchanged as equivalent via the medium of money, its particular content is no longer of any importance to the individual who produces it. Instead of expressing the total being of the producer, encompassing his relationship to himself, his object, other producers and their objects, alienated private property represents an abstraction that appears in isolation from any larger social whole. Now, it's important to note here that it is not uh, the circumstance of mutual need that creates the experience of alienation, but the fact of exchange mediated by an external object. Marx does not imagine man as a self-sufficient monad. Such a man is not, at any rate, a social being. Mutual need is an inescapable and not undesirable aspect of the human condition. And as long as these mutual needs are satisfied through direct social relationships, they need not give rise to alienation, but in fact serve to constitute us as fully human persons. It's noteworthy that whether exchange, uh, whether exchange is on the basis of money or barter makes little difference for Marx in this regard. In both cases, one product is treated as equivalent to another, extinguishing the specific qualities of each and obliterating the producer's personal connection to the object he creates. Accordingly, the product is constituted as external to the producer, whether it is exchanged through barter or via the medium of money. Nevertheless, the introduction of money is important insofar as a concrete object comes to stand in for a direct social relationship and thereby produces a kind of fetishism. As Marx explains, through this alien mediator, man gazes at his will, his activity, his relationship to others as a kind of power independent of himself. It is obvious that this mediator must become a veritable god, since the mediator is the real power over that which mediates me. Marx's early essay on Mill sets up the analysis of money and credit that is contained in his mature political economy. Of course, as has often been noted, the theme of alienation becomes less prominent in Marx's later writings before disappearing almost entirely from capital. Instead of discussing money as a manifestation of alienation, of man from his essence as producer, Marx in his later writings treats money as an abstraction. Now, it's important to realize here that Marx is referring to the very same thing. An abstraction is something that has become separated from, from its specific and particular nature, and as a result, no longer expresses a relationship to a social whole, but exists apart from this social whole. In capital, uh, money is the object that mediates between the commodity's particular nature as use value and its nature as value, stripped of any particularity and devoid of specific content. As we'll see, it is the abstract nature of money, the special, uh, the special capacity of money to assume the commodity's form separated from its particular content that is both the source of financial crises 
and the fetishistic character of money uh, in capitalism. So in the remainder of my uh, time this afternoon, I'm going to suggest that both of these aspects of money, which are heightened with the development of credit as means of payment, are relevant for understanding our contemporary financialized economy. So in, uh, Marx's mature analysis of money is organized around several key functions of money, measure of value, medium of circulation, representative of commodities. Uh, but none of these various functions define the essence of money for Marx. For Marx, uh, the essence of money is given by the commodity, the entity containing the germ of the entire capitalist system within it that expresses a fundamental duality between objects as meaningful, useful particulars, that is, as use values, and objects as abstract equivalents that can be substituted uh, one for another, that is, exchange values. That these two aspects of the commodity exist in contradiction and yet must necessarily coincide is precisely what gives rise to money. As Marx tells us in the first volume of Capital, in an important uh, passage, uh, he writes, money necessarily crystallizes out of the process of exchange in which, in which different uh, products of labor are in fact equated with each other and thus converted into commodities. The historical broadening and deepening of the phenomenon of exchange deepens the opposition between use value and value, which is latent in the nature of the commodity. The need to give an external expression to this opposition for purposes of commercial intercourse produces the drive toward an independent form of value, which finds neither rest nor peace until an independent form has been achieved by the differentiation of commodities and money. <clears throat> So several aspects of Marx's analysis warrant uh, elaboration. Uh, first, uh, the opposition that uh, Marx describes in this passage means that the commodity leads a double existence. On the one side, it is a natural product, and on the other, an exchange value that is quite separate from the natural existence of the commodity. Second, uh, money is itself a commodity that comes to embody the separation. It tears the product from its local context, its particularity, in order to transform it into the equivalent of another product, itself rooted in a different context and containing distinct particularities. Third, while, the, um, uh, while money poses this separation, it also mediates it. Uh, for the abstract or general existence of the commodity in the form of exchange value must ultimately remain tethered to the commodity's natural existence, when it, which it converts into when the exchange culminates. Finally, this conversion can fail. Uh, the commodity's exchange value can become decoupled from the commodity as natural product, with the result that the exchange aborts and a crisis erupts. And here again, um, we immediately see the connection to Marx's earlier analysis of money as a form of alienation. As exchange value, money uh, allows commodities to circulate, but it also represents the commodity in its purely abstract or general aspect, lifted out of the particular relationships in which the producer fabricated it. Accordingly, Marx writes, uh, money does not at all presuppose an individual relationship to its owner. Possession of it is not the development of any particular aspect of his individuality, but rather possession of what lacks individuality. Since this social relation exists at the same time as a, uh, since this social relation exists at the same time as a sensuous external object, which can be mechanically seized and lost in the same manner. But just as this external object may be seized from the individual who possesses it, so may he also use it to exert power over the lives and activities of others. Social relationships have been objectified in exchange value, and individuals are now ruled by abstractions. As Marx pointedly observes, the individual carries his social power as well as his bond with society in his pocket. Critically, uh, money's capacity to achieve uh, a general social existence separated from particular commodities not only generates a kind of fetishism, but is also at the root of the recurrent financial crises that characterize financialized capitalism. In the same manner that the producer's connection to his product becomes accidental as commodities circulating as money break free of the conditions of their production, so does it also become a matter of chance whether this tra transubstantiation of commodities into money succeeds or not. Torn out of its local, natural, individual boundaries, Marx observes, the product can cease to be a product, with the result that the conversion from commodity to money to commodity again is aborted and a general devaluation results. Uh, so consider as an illustrative, illustrative example uh, the mortgage crisis that roiled first American and then global housing markets a decade ago. 
Houses uh, represent, of course, a highly idiosyncratic form of property. The value of a house is dependent on the physical condition of the structure and its features, as well as, as the character of the neighborhood in which it is located. And here the basic problem of market exchange uh, presents itself in sharp relief, how to make unique idiosyncratic commodities equivalent for purposes of exchange. How, in other words, to, to convert particular use values into abstract exchange values so that commodities can find each other on the market. In housing markets, there are various technologies to accomplish this, uh, standardized appraisal and valuation procedures. Uh, but the, the most significant of these techniques in the context of the recent crisis is uh, certainly the securitization of mortgages. And Marx seemed to anticipate securitization when he observed uh, that money is a means of cutting up property into countless fragments and consuming it piece by piece through exchange. Precisely in this fashion, securitization bundles groups of mortgages into risk pools in which the discrete risks associated with each property are averaged across the entire pool. Investors then purchase a prorated share of the pool of mortgages, meaning that they own a, a fractional part of each underlying property, with the result that differences between particular properties are obliterated. In their money form, Marx notes, all commodities look alike. As Marx suggests, the conversion of the commodity into uh, uh, the conversion of the commodity as natural product, the physical structure with its specific idiosyncratic characteristics into the commodity as abstract homogeneous value, enable transactions on a widening scale. But as, as Marx's analysis would also predict, this attempt to, tr to transcend the natural existence of the commodity was inherently self-defeating since the commodity as abstract exchange value must ultimately refer back to the commodity as natural product. In fact, this is precisely what caused the mortgage market to unravel beginning in 2008 as investors in, the mortgage, uh, as investors in mortgage securities became increasingly skeptical of the valuations of the properties they had purchased. When these investors traveled to Florida to inspect the actual, fa uh, actual uh, physical properties they owned, they discovered that property values had become almost entirely disconnected from reality on the ground, and a massive devaluation occurred, bringing the American economy, uh, as we know, to its knees. Now, of course, there was more to the financial crisis than exchange values that had been untethered from use values. There was also a massive acceleration of credit driving transactions in the mortgage market and spurring the inflation of housing prices. And this brings us to a second uh, contradiction that is embedded in the commodity form, uh, the separation of purchase and sale. As Marx explains, just as the exchange value of the commodity leads a double existence as the particular commodity and as money, so does the act of exchange split into two mutually independent acts, exchange of commodities for money and exchange of money for commodities, purchase and sale. In the same manner, in the same manner that exchange necessitates the separation of the commodity in its abstract general form as value from its existence as a particular natural product, so does the breaking apart of circulation into two mutually indifferent phases allow producers to overcome barriers to the exchange of their products. And several implications of Marx's observation here are worth um, noting. Uh, first, Marx uh, recognizes that the exchange of commodities for money on the one side uh, and money for commodities on the other need not coincide temporally or spatially. Exchange takes place in differentiated time and space, and as such, the immediate unity of the process of circulation is not assured. Second, uh, the separation of purchase and sale uh, means that uh, money functions not merely as a passive medium of circulation, allowing commodities to change hands between buyer and seller, but may itself step out of exchange for some period of time. Accordingly, the accumulation of money may become an end in itself, particularly as money takes the form of a hoard. And finally, uh, the piling up of, of uh, money as a, as a hoard, already a step towards the formation of capital, raises the possibility that, in fact, purchase and sale may not balance, and that the splitting of exchange into two acts once again expresses a contradiction that contains the germ of crises. Now, notably, uh, the separation of purchase and sale gives rise to new forms of money. Alongside money as hoard, we see now the emergence of uh, money as means of payment, that is, as credit. Credit accomplishes a number of functions in capitalist economies. Uh, most centrally, it is the basic mechanism that enables purchase and sale to proceed independently from one another. As such, credit allows continuity in the production process, even when the two phases of circulation have been decoupled. 
uh, relatedly, credit reduces circulation time to its absolute minimum, permitting commodities to circulate even before payments have been made. As Marx notes, the entire credit system rests on the necessity of, a, uh, of expanding and leaping over barriers to circulation in the sphere of exchange. But credit overcomes these barriers over to only to posit them again at a more general level. That is, credit temporarily suspends barriers, barriers to exchange, but later resurrects them by pushing the reproduction process to its most extreme limit, with the result that production outstrips social needs. In addition, the growing separation between buying and selling uh, affords opportunities to speculators, re resulting in a colossal system of gambling and swindling. Notably, credit's role as the principal lever of overproduction and excessive special, uh, speculation reflects the fact that those who gain access to credit, as Marx notes, proceed quite unlike owners who, when they function, anxiously weigh the limits of their private capital. So the relevance of Marx's analysis of credit for understanding our contemporary financialized economy hardly requires much elaboration. Uh, we have here all the elements of 21st century financialization, an economy stoked by credit in which production, particularly of houses, breaks free of actual need, products circulating far in advance of payments, payments which may never actually be collected, the reckless abandon of non-owners who mobilize other people's capital to drive the entire system to the brink of disaster, and a desperate scramble for hard cash once the chain of payments is broken, resulting in a sudden and sharp depreciation of asset values. But it's not only the man manner in which excessive reliance on credit makes the economy crisis prone that accounts for the relevance of Marx's analysis in understanding contemporary capitalism in its financialized form. The foundation of the credit system is interest-bearing capital, a form of capital in which the alienation of the capital relation, its fetishization, reaches a culmination. In volume three of Capital, Marx elaborates on interest-bearing capital as, as involving a kind of fetishism in great detail. Of course, uh, the notion that money embodies fetishism is, is a discovery that Marx uh, first made in his earliest economic writings in the, uh, in the 1840s. As I've already discussed, Marx observes in these writings an integral relationship between the development of exchange, the creation of money, and the experience of fetishism. Once money is necessary to mediate exchange, there is an external object existing alongside the commodity that stands outside the producer and exerts a power over him. So what does Marx have to add to these observations when he returns to the problem of fetishism in the context of his mature political economy in volume three of Capital? Primarily, uh, Marx has evolved a better understanding of how capital is valorized in the process of production, allowing him to interpret interest-bearing capital as merely a division of the surplus value between different factions of capital. The money capitalist makes a loan to the industrial capitalist who puts this money to work in the production process by engaging labor in the production of commodities. Critically, the money capitalist does not directly produce value in this transaction, but merely introduces the circuit in which value is produced. As such, interest is a simple payment that the functioning capitalist makes to the money capitalist in compensation for the use of the capital that he has borrowed. But appearances here are misleading. The division between the interest paid out and the profit of enterprise, a merely arbitrary division of the surplus value that Marx reports as nothing more than an empirical fact, gives a superficial impression that one part of the value produced accrues to capital as such, and another part accrues to the operations performed by the active capitalist within the production process. Accordingly, Marx writes, interest appears as the mere fruit of property and capital, capital in itself, abstracted from the reproduction process itself insofar as it does not work, that is, function. Whereas the profit of enterprise appears as the exclusive fruit of the functions that the operating capitalist performs with the capital, as the fruit of capital's movement and process. No wonder, then, that in the popular mind, interest-bearing capital is capital par excellence, that is, surplus value that capital yields and which it would yield without productive application. Marx goes on to observe that while for the individual capitalist this impression is accurate, the individual capitalist really does make a choice between lending out uh, his capital or throwing it into production. It is an absurdity at the level of society as a whole. It is utter nonsense, Marx writes, to suggest that all capital could be transformed into money capital without the presence of people to buy and valorize the means of production. If an inappropriately large number of capitalists sought to transform their capital into money capital, 
the result would be a tremendous devaluation of money capital and a fall in the rate of interest. Many people would find themselves unable to live on interest and compelled to turn back into industrial capitalists. Weary of the difficulties of productive investment, capitalists may be lured into purely speculative maneuvers. But as a sustainable pattern of economic development, this is entirely self-defeating. A more current statement on the perils of financialization could hardly be imagined. So in this paper, I have considered uh, Marx's expansive writings on money and credit. Rather than treat money and credit as secondary within Marx's broader theory of capitalism, as is often done, I've considered Marx's views on money and credit as offering an analysis that is particularly useful for understanding the dynamics of financialized capitalism. What makes Marx's theory of money so useful for understanding financialization is precisely its grounding, I've suggested, in the notion of alienation. The basic insight is that the development of capitalism has broken apart pre-existing forms of social organization in which, ma in which man's relationships were lived directly rather than mediated through exchange. Of course, I'm hardly the first to note that alienation is Marx's master concept. Ullman's work, on which I've relied heavily, makes this case in a more elaborate and sustained fashion than I can here. Uh, rather, my more modest contribution is to suggest how important Marx's theory of money and credit is for carrying the notion of alienation uh, through Marx's early and later works, even when the concept nominally disappears, as it does especially in Capital. Money is an object that represents the commodity stripped of its particular content, and as such, it is both what allows exchange to occur and expresses the separation of the producer from his product. It is also what gives rise to fetishism. As soon as an external thing exists alongside the commodity, individuals engaged in exchange are bound to invest it with mysterious powers, especially as it appears to spontaneously give rise to the movement of commodities. So what does such a vantage point on Marx's political economy have to offer contemporary understandings of financialized capitalism? Uh, notably, we have here a different account of the crisis-prone nature of financialized capitalism than the standard heterodox account with its emphasis on the role of collective cognitions in systematically mispricing financial assets. From Keynes to Kindleberger to Minsky to Schiller, uh, the consensus view among heterodox economists seems to be that collective beliefs and sentiments, whether these are characterized as rational or irrational, drive speculative dynamics in financial markets. However much uh, an improvement such heterodox accounts represent over neoclassical economics, I think they under-theorize the na nature of these collective cognitions, wh which after all need have nothing specifically capitalist about them. In this regard, co uh, collective cognitions are also important to Marx's account. But understanding these cognitions as, as an expression of an underlying condition of alienation, that is fetishism, uh, directs us to a deeper analysis of, of financial crises as resulting from two fundamental contradictions embedded in the commodity form. Each of these contradictions between uh, the commodity as exchange value and use value and between two phases of the circulation process that have broken uh, apart are manifestations of an internal unity um, that has become uh, broken apart and must be forcibly integrated through, if necessary, a violent explosion. We've already noted how well these, uh, how well these two accounts of crisis map onto aspects of our recent experience. And in this sense, Marx offers an analysis that is surprisingly contemporary in its depiction of the dynamics of financialized capitalism. But Marx does more than merely provide an account that translates well to the present day. His treatment of money and credit also allows us to gain leverage on one of the most puzzling aspects of contemporary financialization, uh, namely the problem, of where, of where, uh, of the problem of explaining where financial profits come from. Many commentators have grappled with this issue directly or indirectly, and yet Marx's answer is deceptively simple. Financial profits are nothing more than an accidental division of the surplus between money and industrial capitalists. Financial profits seem to be self-generating only because, as Marx notes, it is forgotten that both interest and the profit of enterprise are simply parts of the surplus value, and that such a division can in no way change the nature of surplus value, its origins, and its conditions of existence. It is, of course, the fetishistic uh, nature of money in general and interest-bearing capital in particular that enables this forgetting, reinforced by the fact that paper titles circulate in markets apparently subject to their own determinations. But as Marx pointedly observes, capital does not exist twice over, once as the capital value of the ownership titles, and then again as the capital invested or to be invested in the enterprises in question. It exists, Marx reminds us, 
only in the latter form, with the title to ownership merely bestowing upon its possessor a share of the surplus value that this capital realizes. As such, these paper duplicates of annihilated capital are pure illusion, an illusion that nevertheless powerfully shapes social life under capitalism in ways that Marx's theory of money and credit apprehends with remarkable clarity and vision. Thank you. Thank you, Greta. We have uh, 20 minutes for discussion, and Axel Paul is the first. Yeah, thank you very much <clears throat> for the very concise presentation uh, uh, on Marx, on credit and money. Um, um, let me begin with a statement. Uh, I'm, I'm very much in favor of separating uh, normative statements from analytical treatments. Uh, however, uh, or because of this, uh, I, I do not really see uh, what your proof that Marxian's theory of money and credit is based on his highly, substantially normative theory of alienation. Um, um, uh, delivers uh, in, in kind of uh, an analytical understanding of contemporary capitalism. So M Marx is giving the impression in his uh, critique of alienation um, that there has been and moreover that there could be again another kind of society uh, which is not ruled by abstraction. Uh, he's, he's by himself fetishizing, fe how do you say that, F fetishizing, uh, he, he's mm -hmm. treating uh, uh, um, it as, as a fetish as if people could relate to each other immediately. Uh, he, he's, he's totally romantic in his, in his early writings uh, as if exchange uh, uh, could always and should always be something like a romantic love relationship. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not against love, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not against relationships uh, which are not mediated by money. However, I, I, I do ask myself uh, in how far a society, as, as we live in today, can be mediated without such a thing as money. And that's why uh, uh, there is nothing uh, on the liberating effects of money uh, that has been that have been spelled out by by Zimmel especially and and others uh, so far. So my question again, um, uh, if it is true and I assume it to be true uh, that the theory of alienation is a normative theory, can help us to understand to do away with whatever financial crises. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, can I, oh, can sorry. I just um, one one Good second? Evening. So you you will answer directly. I have Sasha Munich and others who want to participate. Please uh, show up. Then I can collect already and make a list. But now, so Greta, it's you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for the question. It's very uh, uh, thought provoking. I mean, I, I think uh, we might disagree on on first premises uh, in, in that. I mean, I'm not sure I would make a clear. Uh, such a clean distinction between the normative and the analytical and Marx. I mean, in my view, those are always running together, um, perhaps more saliently in the early writings than in later writings. But I, I mean, I, I read Marx always as a normative statement and a moral critique alongside an analysis. And so I'm, you know, I, I think the, the fact that these are, are, you know, very clearly joined um, in the analysis of alienation is not, is not problematic for me. Um, I, I think it's part of what gives um, some power to that analysis. Um, as far as what we, you know, what we get out of that analysis, I mean, I think what, what the notion, you know, what Marx's notion of alienation, I think, gives us and what, what draws me to it in terms of thinking about that as a lens even into the later writing is, again, that, you know, the notion of um, a kind of separation from a social whole, an abstraction that has lost this kind of particular content. Um, Understanding how uh, powerful that is in terms of the capacity of money to remake so social relationships, I think, is is a fundamental contribution of that. Um, you know, that work in Marx. It relates uh, to some degree to I think what Wolfgang said this morning about the indeterminacy of money. Right, the indeterminacy of money. It's it's the the way in which money lifts 
um, relation, lifts the objects out of the particular relationships in, in which they exist, which Marx has a very clear analysis about how that, abs uh, how that indeterminacy is part and parcel of the transformative power of money, right? Once, once we've sort of removed, um, uh, it, you know, we, we've removed these social relationships from the ways in which they're bound and constricted within their, their particular, uh, you know, their particularities, made them general and abstract, um, you know, that's where money becomes, as, as Marx puts it, a kind of a highly energetic solvent that dissolves the, uh, the, the ancient community. And so, I mean, I think, there, there, I think there's a lot there in terms of understanding, um, you know, the, the power of money to transform and remake social relationships. I mean, the second thing that I, I think is, is a more, maybe even more direct, that comes out of, of thinking about, um, uh, you know, alienation as a kind of grounding of Marx's political economy is the idea of fetishism, I mean, it, itself, which is, is you know, uh, closely bound up with the notion of alienation. Um, I mean, I think as far as understanding financialization and the way in which we think about financialization, um, you know, the way in which we've conceptualized um, the social world, uh, a, a, social, a social world and an economy do dominated by finance, we're presented over and over again with narratives about finance kind of breaking free of, of other social relationships as a power that's, um, you know, kind of coming from nowhere and, and exerting itself uh, from every direction. So, I mean, in my, in my view, that's, that's language that is, you know, very connected to this idea of fetish, fetish, uh, fetishism. And I, you know, so I, I think that, you know, th this is, I think Marx offers, um, you know, a more powerful account of fetishism um, you know, as a, as a feature of a financialized economy than than yeah, than any other account I've I've encountered, and and again, I mean, I think that's that's an account that's very much rooted in, in the notion of alienation. Um, as, as far as um, you know, your your last point, which is a good one, you know, this is a kind of romantic view. It's as as, as if we could you know do without exchange or money. Uh, you know, I mean, this is the basic, um, you know, the, the attraction and the difficulty of Marx in, in a certain sense is he's. You know, he's, it's, it's, it's a critique of capitalism, which sort of gestures at an alternative. It's very hard to Im imagine what that alternative would be and how you would actually construct it. And so, I mean, yes, I mean, I think that's, that's part of the nature of the beast um, with, with Marx's sort of critical um, analysis is we don't, um, you know, once you're within this system, it's very difficult to imagine like what, what the alternative is. So, I mean, that's, that's not a problem I, you know, can or will solve. I think it's kind of endemic to, to Marx's um, you know, his, his analysis in some way. Thank you. Next, Aunt Sorg, and then it's you. Sasha. Thanks. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I can uh, join on that. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, when Marx used the word alienation or entfremdung, in, in fact, he was uh, latching on to more widespread, fairly sober utilization of the terms in juridical language. And Fremdung was when you sort of let go of your calf and handed it to the butcher. Mm -hmm. You know, that was alienation. It passed from your sort of domain of disposition and property to someone else's. And there was no romanticism involved in the process of handing over the calf to the, the butcher. Um, so that was the fairly sober use of the term in both English and in German. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then, you know, you had on the other hand, this ambiguity uh, with respect to the sort of students in 1968 moaning about, oh, the workers are alienated and so mm -hmm. on, you know. That is the more uh, sort of emotion laden. Mm -hmm. thing. And we, we just, you know, we are faced with this ambiguity. But I wanted to ask you about a specific, another term. Um, you used the word transubstantiation. Was that directly taken from Marx? Was it? Yeah, that's... Uh... Um, what are, you, are your ideas about the background? I mean, was it transubstantiation in German, transubstantiation? I, well, I didn't read it in German, so, um, no. but I mean, it's... it's okay. It's the, I, I believe that's the, uh, the Grandista is where it's... Because it's, yeah. it's a very peculiar term. It, it means in, in Catholic and, right. and uh, Lutheran dogma, the changing of sub substance from bread and wine into the flesh of our Lord and uh, his blood. So 
I mean, is that kind of link? Well, he, he does actually, I mean, he, he does, I mean, link back to, um, you know, religious concepts regularly in, in discussing alienation. So, I mean, and it comes out of the critique of religion. So, I mean, it's not totally surprising that that, that relationship is there. Um, but, I mean, it's, you're, you're right. It's very striking so language. Yes, I, yes, I think he, he, he was, yes, I, yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, and I, yeah, it's a, it's a very deliberate appropriation, it seems. Okay, but we would have to see what this actually is in the German version, yeah, and we, we don't know what has been translated there. It, it, it may, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Sascha Münich. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, I, I was wondering, I, I wanted to take up a point here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to take up a point that you made in the discussion. Is also, shouldn't we be more, I mean, if we understand it more, more radically, are we maybe wrong as, as, as social scientists when we're speaking about financial capitalism? as an analytical concept, I mean, we're basically treating, uh, in many models, as, as you mentioned, we, we're basically treating this uh, historical period of capitalism as some, uh, as of, uh, yeah, it, in this period we're treating capitalism as if it was built exclusively out of exchange value and, abs and, and abstract value, or it's maybe the most dominant element in capitalism, and may, maybe we should get get rid of this and let's, let's you know, remember us of that that is always the two sides, which will change a lot of, of of, of these an, an analytical perspectives that we have. So maybe it's not a, we're not in a period of financial capitalism, but maybe in a period of especially alienated capitalism or something like that, because we as, as a society think of all society, even as scientists, in exchange value terms now. So, I mean, I, th I think in general, um, you know, I mean, we do have to be careful about proliferating terminology that, you know, becomes you know, then, then a sort of, uh, you know, a, a not yet another sort of thing to work through in the analysis and doesn't add anything to it. I mean, in this particular case, I, you know, I, I, I guess I'll, you know, put, put a stake down in saying that I, I do think, um, you know, what do we call it, financial capitalism or financialization, whatever term you prefer. I mean, there, I think there is a kind of, um, you know, a, some kind of empirical basis for saying that, um, you know, in the period since the, say, 1980s, something fairly, uh, you know, significant shifted in, in the way that, um, you know, profits accumulate um, in, you know, in, in, in several of the advanced industrial uh, economies and, 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 and more broadly as well. And, you know, we, we, could, we could debate about what language to use, but I think we do want to have some language to capture uh, an economy that's uh, organized in a different fashion than what preceded it. And, you know, so, so I mean, I would, I would you know, I don't, I don't care about the particular language, but I think... Um, having concepts that allow us to, to, you know, grasp, you know, fairly fundamental shifts in the way the economy is organized is, is, is helpful. Aransa. Well, thank you very much. Um, I was just curious because Jens Becker told us uh, a while ago that um, the labor theory of value is, is dead. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering whether you would agree with that and if the changes the perspective on the first uh, bullet point, say, well, if it's that, where does this surplus value come from that accidentally gets um, devised between money and industrial capitalists? Yes. So I, I was wondering whether I would have to take a position on the labor theory of value, and I was thinking about what that position would be if I were so asked. And I, I guess I, I, one reason I like this formulation that Marx, um, you know, that I was raising at the end about um, the question of where financial profits come from and, I, and the, the formulation that Marx m makes about, um, you know, capital doesn't exist twice over. It's, it doesn't exist as the, you know, the physical capital and then the, the title to the ownership of that capital. Those are not, you know, we can't double count. Um, I think that that's a way of thinking about this problem of, of where financial profits come from without having to fall into some kind of um, rigid adherence to something like the labor theory of value, which, um, as Jens, you know, noted, is is troubled and and you know, you know who wants to go back into that um, rabbit hole? Um, you know, this to me seems like an entirely reasonable proposition that doesn't actually. Um, I, I don't think it directly says anything about all profits, uh, uh, rather surplus value necessarily having to be produced by labor, that being the sole source of, of value. 
it just says we can't double count. I mean, you can't have, I mean, which when you think about the way in which the financial system, which layers claim upon claim upon claim, uh, you know, at some point that, that, you know, that has to be rooted in something, right? And so it's, 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 I think it's getting at that sort of layering of claims and how absurd that is um, rather than a, a statement about, um, you know, where, um, where value ultimately comes from. So, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm agnostic on the labor theory of value and I, I don't think I've committed myself to it here, um, but, um, and, and, I, and I, I really like this way of, of thinking about, um, uh, you know, financial profits as, you know, a, a kind of division um, rather than, um, um, so, I mean, I, I find that uh, 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 illuminating and helpful, yeah. Mm. Okay, I think it's directly to this axle, then. Yeah, it's yeah. a proposition. Mm. Uh, thanks for giving me the word again. Uh, uh, I think I have a proposition to, to solve your question. Um, uh, I, I would say the struggle that you, Jens, described in your talk between price and value, or uh, your Marx quote, are both referring uh, to a double existence of that double existence of, of value. Mm -hmm. uh, but and, and, and the lure is there to assume uh, that one of these registers is anchored in the real world, signifying be it the value, the objective value of of, uh, uh, of labor be it the usefulness of products as in neoclassical economics. And I would suggest uh, we have to deal with, with two layers of constructions. Uh, and uh, and, and the, the problem of financial capitalism is uh, uh, the deviation between these two layers of, mm -hmm. of value construction. Uh, uh, and the fault is to assume that when uh, uh, conventions, value conventions on secondary or uh, third or fourth markets uh, of valuations collapse, uh, we are falling back on the real value instead of seeing that we are still dealing with a kind of construction. Uh, the, the assumption we have something real is a construction as the construction of second order ob observation as, as, uh, as we have to deal with uh, uh, in, uh, in, in financial markets. Did you get my point? Yeah, no, I, I, think, I, I, I think I understand your uh, comment. Um, and I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I think it, it does bear a little bit on, um, I mean, it, it intersects with the, the um, you know, the Marxist analysis of the sort of separation of, of the commodity as abstract in general from the commodity as you know, what he calls natural product, um, with the natural product, I suppose, being the real. Um, and I think the point that he makes in his analysis is simply that, you know, the, 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 ultimately there has to be a relationship between those two. And when it, when it becomes stretched, then you're, you're, you know, potentially in trouble, which I mean, I think is one way of understanding, um, you know, the nature of financial crises. It's the, you know, the uh, exchange, you know, the, the abstract existence of the commodity as exchange value no longer um, can, can meet up with the product as it exists somewhere embedded in, um, you know, uh, an actual set of social relationships that are particular and specific. And, you know, I mean, whether we call one real and, or, you know, you know, I, I, that, that's a sort of a, philo you know, philosophy of science question in some way. But I mean, I think that's the, that's the tension, the, um, you know, the, the commodity is, as existing in a set of social relationships that are particular and specific and the commodity as a kind of abstract entity that floats above those and, and can on occasion become um, you know, entirely decoupled from them, so. Okay, I have three more questions and I would like to take them all together now and then one brief answer. You mm -hmm. choose what you want okay. to answer from <laughs> this uh, at the end. Yeah. Dealer's choice. So Wolfgang is yeah. the next. Um, I, I would uh, try something out on you, namely driving this a little further. Now the, um, uh, much of the, of the uh, money this, th which is earned in the financial industry seems to be the result of huge piles of debt being traded between different institutions and then piled up, uh, dressed up in a new way, then again sold for fees and, and uh, provisions and, and, and all. Now, that would b b probably work without any industrial capitalists. It, it would work with sort of future anticipated industrial capitalists, which at some time in the future would be willing to deliver on these enormous amounts of entitlements that are being continuously created and expanded, the, the limit of which is simply 
in the ability of the system to convince everybody that at some stage someone will pay for all this. Mm -hmm. And in other words, also you have insurance uh, re regimes to, 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 it's con money in the sort of, in, like, in, like a con man in the English language, yeah? It's con money. And with con money, if, especially if the central banks can throw in almost unlimited fiat money into the game, and they give it not mm -hmm. to, to, to the two of us, they give it to Deutsche Bank or to, 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 to Goldman Sachs. And if they throw in unlimited money, then you can sort of make a lot of money, mm -hmm. a lot of profits without anything being produced, only in the expectation that it will be produced in 50 years. And, 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 and if the sort of insurance regime makes sure that you believe even something that will be produced in 70 years can be traded now, then there's almost unlimited possibility for profit. Mm -hmm. uh, Herr Faust. Thank you. I understood your uh, contribution as a very general theory about capitalism, uh, the role of money as capital and the role of credit in it, and a potential explanation for, for um, capitalist crises that are always financial crises. And um, then the question arises, however, how do you distinguish particular stages of capitalist development that are called fi financialized capitalism that are associated with developments of the late 20th century. What is the distinction from this very general theory of capitalist development and such a particular phase or stage of capitalist development? Okay. Chris Hamm is the last person. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is provoked by the discussion about real. I'm, I'm going to sound very naive as well as reactionary now, but uh, you've obviously read everything, scoured all the texts on money and credit, but I didn't hear anything to suggest that Marx was really historicizing money, though economic historians write seriously about money objects, money relations over thousands of years. Am I right in assuming that Marx basically never challenged Adam Smith's account of money originating because barter is inefficient, it comes simultaneously with the market and with trade. So all the deconstructing mm -hmm. that Karl Polanyi and David Graeber more recently mm -hmm. have indulged in, for Marx, this is not part of the game. He's more interested in Hegelian games and not in the real evolution of money. Well, he, I mean, he, he does discuss it, but I think you're right that his account is, is quite similar to Smith. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, this is direct, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a emerges out of the limitations of barter as a form of exchange um, and, and goes from there. So it's, it's not, um, you know, there, there's quite a lot in um, the Grandrista and in, in, you know, both one and three of capital and sort of the historical evolution of money. Um, but not, I, I think, in, in broad strokes, you know, doesn't deviate from the Smithian view. Um, for, for the, I can quickly uh, comment on the, uh, the other two questions. Um, the question about how to distinguish capitalism as, in its financialized form. I mean, there are many ways one could do that, and people have done it. I mean, the way I've done it is looking at, um, you know, where profits are generated in an economy. And it's, it's fairly straightforward, empirical, uh, task and one can show that um, you know there's a really dramatic movement of profit making into financial segments of the economy and even within non-financial firms more and more revenues accruing through through purely uh, kind of speculative activity so uh, you know there are many ways to, to do that but I think that's one one way and I think that's you know I would think that's a you know these are sort of I mean that's kind of empirical task at some at some level um, so, Wolfgang, I'll, I think I can just sign on to your comment. I mean, I fully agree. Um, Marx uses the language in, in, in talking about credit as, as creating a kind of colossal system of gambling and swindling, which, you know, maps on to, you know, the, the con idea. So, yes, I mean, I think this is absolutely um, an accurate way to, to, um, to characterize um, what, what goes on here. Um, and, I mean, I think yeah, you've, you've captured it well. Um, so, I mean, I think I, you know, just, just uh, accept your comment. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, we don't have a break actually, but we will continue <laughs> right away.
Okay, we will stay with the with the topic of money. Uh, actually, now in our next session, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Aaron Saar uh, as our next speaker. Aaron Saar is a researcher here at the Institute for Sozialforschung, institute where we are currently. He is a sociologist with a special interest in the sociology of money. Uh, he published, uh, I believe last year it was, uh, a book entitled The Promise of Money, A Practice Theory of Credit, which is a very important statement on the sociology of money. Today's talk by Aaron Saar is called From Pen Strokes to Keystrokes, The Production of Money in Early and Contemporary Capitalism. Aaron, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Jens Beckert and Wolfgang Knöbel for the opportunity to speak here among icons of economic sociology and political economic inquiry. And I will continue to do so until my presentation is... Uh, I'm especially thankful because my own track record is humble compared of, to some of the others in this room. We're here, all here on the occasion on an anniversary to critically evaluate the contribution of the person we are celebrating with the advantage of hindsight, which makes us not the most welcome kind of party guests, I'm afraid. Uh -huh. Nevertheless, I want to play this role today with respect to money and more specifically to the theoretical frameworks in which the concept of money is embedded. Theories of money in its capitalist form are inseparable from theories of capitalism itself. That is, of course, one of Karl Marx's crucial strategic arguments regarding money. An understanding of capitalist conditions is always a theory about a special form of monetarized social order, as we've heard today before. More to the point, is it is impossible to work on a general conceptual framework guiding our investigations of political economy without discussing what money is as well. I'd like to build upon this Marxian insight today. In recent years, the theoretical interest in money has grown tremendously in the social sciences. For decades, heterodox economists have worked far from the limelight of public attention on sophisticated critiques of what they perceive to be the uniform mainstream theory of money. Karl Marx is himself considered part of this mainstream and not just by his competitors. Influential contemporary Marxists like Anwar Shaikh have spent a lot of ink formulating their critique of heterodox economic monetary theories. Marx aimed to develop a theory of capitalist money by contrasting money under, under capitalist conditions with a general theory of money. And in crucial aspects, this general theory, we've just discussed this, closely resembles the theories taught in university economics departments in his time. But calling someone mainstream surely isn't reason enough to dismiss his work as a foundation for inquiries into capitalism, even if one prefers heterodox theories of money. Instead, I'd like to take Smart seriously by evaluating the concept of money as an element of a broader framework applied to studies of capitalist conditions and this broader framework consists of a theoretical trinity of three interrelated concepts investigated by Marx, money, capital, and surplus. It is my intention to develop a sharp contrast between two basic versions of this framework, one associated with Marx and the other with a more heterodox take on money. Because the fields of monetary theory are, like every other field of theory, of course, hopelessly heterogeneous. I'd like to simplify things even further by personalizing both alternatives. What I'd like to discuss is basically Karl Marx's version of this the theoretical trinity in contrast to Josef Schumpeter's. Debates about the theory of money are structured by two focal points, or as they have been called, two meta-theories of money. 
as Schumpeter famously put it, economic discourse knows two logical fundaments of monetary theories. These are not themselves fully developed theories of money, but rather ideas or imaginaries that preform the way money is conceptualized. On the one hand, there is the so-called commodity theory, which is associated with neoclassical economics and, according to Jeffrey Ingham and others, with some sociological classics, including Marx. On the other hand, there is the so-called credit theory of money associated with different strands of heterodox economists. Modern monetary theorists <laughs> might be the most popular among them these days. To differentiate these two fundaments, we might begin with a simple question. From a sociological point of view, what is so fascinating about money and modern economies? What phenomenon is it that we want to theorize? The most common answer to this question is this. What's most fascinating about money is its value. At some point in time, people began to accept something in exchange for their goods and services that in itself had no or almost no other value than its acceptability in further exchanges. Georg Simmel famously considered money to be a social promise of future goods, that is, a value defined as a potential for future exchange. And so does Karl Marx when he begins his investigation of money. His starting point is the curious phenomenon of something that has an exchange value without any or near to any use value. Marx calls this formal use value that became universal equivalent to mediate exchange. I would follow Duncan Foley's suggestion that for Marx, money is first a social arrangement to account for and secondly exercise exchange power. Quote. What commodity theory means in this context is that this kind of inquiry tends to reflect on money as if it had the same properties that commodities possess. What classifies commodities as commodities in this context is the fact that they can be owned and that they have an exchange value. Money in this tradition refers to a valuable means used to set prices for and exchange goods and services. Quantity theory means talking about money as an asset defined by acceptability in exchange and its ability to be exchanged. The commodity theory invokes a certain image of a macroscopic shape of money as well, meaning if we take money to be an ownable exchange power or the system to account for ownable exchange power, the shape of total money is that of a su supply of available liquidity within a given system. Credit theories chose another starting point for their reasoning about money. Obviously, they neither deny that money is a functional instrument for pricing and acquiring goods and services, nor that it is valuable. But they find a different aspect of modern money fascinating. Basically, they argue that we should start constructing a theory of money by theorizing something other than exchange value. And this something other is the fact that modern money consists of bank liabilities. What we call money in everyday life is, at least formally, a liability in the balance sheet of a bank. That is, it is a credit-debt relation between a bank as a debtor and a creditor. This is true for cash as well as for deposits and as such as a simple observation, not controversial. No one denies that fiat money is formally bank debt. Of course, it would be ridiculous to assume that anyone arguing based on the logical fundament of commodity theory doesn't know that, doesn't know that money is a financial asset. What's controversial is whether the fact that money means liabilities of the banking system has any relevance in theory. The crucial question for a theory of money is whether, it, whether we can understand money as bank debt with theories that identify money solely in terms of the asset half of this relation, which is what commodity theories propose. 
credit theorists doubt that this is a good idea and therefore suggest that money should not be identified with exchange power, but rather with a bank's promise as a social relation. This alternative point of departure leads, leads us onto a different conceptual path. If we adopt the description of money as a social relationship between banks and their customers, we are forced to reevaluate common concepts of payments as well. While we tend to view the economy as an exchange of assets, an idea deeply invested into sociological theories of markets, for example, from the perspective of credit theory, to pay for some, something means to alter debt relations. It is more like a social practice of borrowing and clearing debt. If my money is a liability of a banking system, then paying for a coffee means that after the transaction, my bank owes me less, and the bank of the barista, as coffee sellers are now called, owes him more. In saying this, I want to amplify the, I want to stress the fact that different theories of money are not just different names for cash, but rather imply different descriptions of interactions within a monetarized economy. If money, if money is a very specific social relation, then we cannot fully subscribe to the macroscopic view proposed by the commodity tradition. Money is not an aggregate of assets in the sense of a supply of liquidity. Instead, as Perry Merling puts it, it is a money grid, quote, a web of time-dated promises to pay stretching from now into the future and from here around the globe, end of quote. Creditor-debtor relations are highly interdependent as they are promises to alter other credit-debt relations. So every act of a payment, as well as an application for credit or the use of an overdraft facility, changes, sometimes in a small, sometimes in a larger way, parts of this web of promises of this money grid. These different traditions in thinking about money, which I have sketched here very briefly, resonates with, with different perspectives on capital. The close association of money with exchange power matches a specific description of sources of capitalist dynamics. As we all know, Marx views the modern economy as driven by a certain mode of circulation that is money owners buying commodities to sell for a positive return on investment or MCM prime. Consequently, the process kick-starting capitalism, so-called primitive accumulation, we have heard about it, for Marx is the process in which the rising bourgeoisie appropriates society's stock of capital, leaving the working class with nothing to trade but their bodies and minds. With this description, Marx makes two fundamental theoretical decisions. First, he commits to the idea that ownership of assets is the very form of power that drives capitalism, while secondly, savings of past income is the main source of this power. Money owners decide to invest exchange power, power they have saved in order to earn more than they spend. This is a transformation of already existing money into capital from a Marxian point of view. But just as Marx is not the only one to adhere to a particular concept of money, he's also far from being alone in asserting that ownership of assets is the very form of power that drives capitalism. Take, for example, liberal discourse on economic justice from Hayek to Nozick or Friedman, in which the very word, e word economy is associated with private owners deciding what to do with their private property. Accordingly, non-Marxist sociologist Niklas Luhmann argues, modern economies are defined by the establishment of a reliable source of power the power, quote, to have, to own something. Modern capitalist economies are routinely described as empires of ownership, so to speak. This is the point where Marx and Schumpeter go separate ways when it comes to capital. Schumpeter's approach to capitalism is occasionally read with a strong focus on his ideas of entrepreneurship 
and creative destruction. But these two ideas within his approach are not primary features of capitalist economies, but secondary effects of a social practice that emerged in Europe together with the establishment of bank debt as a means of payment. Schumpeter calls this practice credit creation. As soon as paper checks and accounting entries of bank liabilities came into use in daily transactions, banks became able to produce means of payment by simply writing down a number on a sheet of paper. They created deposits without demanding that they were made first. With a certain neck for words, historian Michael North refers to Venetian banks' practice of registering book value independent of previously saved cash as generating purchasing, purchasing power, quote, by a simple stroke of a pen. Venetian banks are thus called banchi di scritta, which literally translate, at least roughly, to writing tables. And at least since the 14th century, as Schumpeter famously remarks, banks have not just been merchants, but producers of money. For Schumpeter, this credit creation of assets and liabilities by a simple stroke of a pen marks the beginning of capitalism. Credit creation, that is, the ability to manufacture savings by a stroke of a pen, is not a process of accumulation in a Marxian sense. It is not a drain of exchange power already present in the system. The theoretical scope of Schumpeter's argument is that bank money economies do not depend on those with savings to finance investments. Accumulation is but one source of financial power in capitalism, but it is not a power that is able to increase the financial value within an economy. Marx, contemporary Marxists, but even some explicitly anti-Marxist approaches imagine credit as part of the empire of ownership, as operationally constrained by production and savings. The notion of banks as intermediaries reallocating funds from savers to borrowers can still be found in recent publications, by no means just Marxist ones. Neoclassical versions of this theory of an ownership-dependent credit system are discussed in terms of fractional reserve banking. This notion is crucial for Marx's view of the banking system as well, and also favored by contemporary Marxists. Fractional reserve banking is primarily the assumption that private banks depend on central bank money, which they can't manufacture themselves. As skillful and risk-sensitive actors, private banks make sure that they accumulate these funds in form of savings before creating new money. The whole idea, the whole theoretical idea of banks being intermediates between providers and users of funds necessarily depends on this assumption, the assumption that banks need at least a bit of inflow of exchange power before they, they can create their own. However, this is not an accurate description about today's monetary system. Last year, even German Bundesbank admitted that if the private sector creates a demand for reserves, these reserves are created after the fact. Fractional reserve system is not a valid description of our actual banking system. In today's fiat money systems, previously existing assets no longer constrain money creation by banks. Needless to say, banks today no longer use pens to produce money, but type numbers on a computer keyboard and thus, quote, keystroke money into existence. The production of money in the private sector depends on borrowers demanding credit and on calculations and evaluations of credit worthiness and profitability. Therefore, the money grid is highly elastic, expanding pro-cyclically in good times, and as we all know, as a grid of interdependent promises, contracting in bad times. <coughs> and this dynamic is not operationally linked to production or labor, <coughs> nor is it related to the question of money's exchange value. Sociologically speaking, this means that money is driven by expectations about the future, not things done in the past. Again, this doesn't mean that money's value rests upon expectations, which of course it does, but that the available means for financing investments do. 
to paraphrase economist N. Pettifor, the question of what capitalist societies can pay for, what they are able to finance, is always in the end a question of willpower and collective imaginaries. To quote Schumpeter's disciple Hyman Minsky, it depends on an expectational climate or on imaginable futures, to refer to Jens Becker. This doesn't mean, of course, that the banking sector can pay for everything or that we can build everything we can pay for. Of course not. Natural resources are scarce, and neither do I want to imply that there are no constraints on keystroke financing, on keystroking money into existence. Nor do I want to imply that the ownership of assets, as ex the ownership of exchange power, is not important. But it is precisely the fascinating tension that exists in capitalist economies from a Schumpeterian point of view that capitalism is an experiment in, experiment in which the production and distribution of scarce resources is facilitated with the help of a money grid that can be elastic to an almost unlimited extent and one that is governed by profit-oriented actors. In the second half of the 20th century, potentials for private keystroke financing have been expanded and banks have been proven more than willingly to create money. We have seen the spread of deposits as a means of payment in everyday life since the late 1960s and in many countries, political nudging towards private borrowing politics of home ownership or later on privatized Keynesianism. We have seen a wave of liberalization and globalization of deposit creation and financial relations. Opportunities for banks and borrowers to meet have been extended since the 1980s by deregulation and globalization. Formerly regionally oriented banks were confronted with a world full of potential borrowers waiting for credit creation. This development was, of course, intensified by innovations in calcula calculative techniques, risk management, and contractual creativity. In the meantime, governments used their own ability to create money primarily to support private economic interests, an idea misleadingly called central bank independence. The impact of money creating keystrokes as a separate source of power in capitalism on the current state of our economy is obvious. We know that the rise of the so-called shadow banking system, including, of course, practices of securitization, relied heavily on the credit lines provided by commercial banks and their ability to produce money. We know that the current account imbalances in the Eurozone can only be understood if one accounts for the fact that the money supply has been constantly increased in demand-driven economies, whereas there had been a reluctance to do the same in other economic systems. We know that the process of financialization was driven by the inflation of asset prices, which in turn was to a great extent caused by what Bizema, Bizema and his co-authors call the debt shift. Debt shift refers to private banks switching from financing businesses to crafting new money for the pur purchase of already existing assets which pushed up their prices over the course of many years. And we know that rising inequalities in income and wealth were reinforced by the fact that only the few were able to benefit from this process of keystroke-fueled expansion of the money grid. Keystroke capitalism seems to be a much more influential driving force within our political economy today than early participants of penstroke capitalism in Schumpeter's sense would ever have imagined. On the theoretical level, the line of thought represented by Schumpeter offers one final alternative to Marx I want to refer today, if only very briefly if for the lack of time. I'm referring to the question of surplus. For Marx, surplus was inseparable, inseparable from all basic reasoning about money and capital. Marx begins his argument by suggesting that capitalism is a form of economic circulation in which money is invested to get more money, MCM prime. But where, does Marx ask, 
does this surplus, this M prime, come from in a macroscopic sense? How is the capitalist class able to earn more monetary value than they throw into circulation? More broadly, and in slightly comparative time terms, how is the private sector, or at least a minority within the private sector, able to save? Let me quote Marx. If commodities or commodities and money of equal exchange value are exchanged, it is plain that no one extracts more value from that than he throws into circulation. There is no creation of surplus value. We must rather look whether there is in this simple circulation anything permitting an expansion of the value that enters into circulation and, consequently, a creation of surplus value. And the one thing that will permit an expansion is, of course, production through labor. For Marx, only labor possesses the ability to generate more use value and in the, that way expand the exchange value that can be appropriated by capitalists. Today, as we now know, the labor theory of value is widely discredited in economic sociology as a theory of valuation and pricing. It has been replaced by much more sophisticated theories, many of them proposed by scholars from the Max Planck Institute for the Studies of Societies. But as Sascha Munich and Wolfgang Knöbel recently pointed out in separate papers, the labor theory of value hasn't been discussed with the same verb as the theory of total surplus, or as Munich and Knöbel frame it, profits. In other words, Marx's labor theory has been abandoned as a theory of value, but without any intensive effort to replace it as a theory of the existence of total surplus or total profits. Economic sociology's reluctance to address this issue may be traced to the heritage of neoclassical microeconomics, where, to quote the title of another excellent essay by David A. Louis et al., quote, where profits come from is a question that few ever ask. As far as I can see, Schumpeter is hardly read as a competitor to Marx's labor theory of value in this respect, but in fact he offers a different solution to Marx's problem, and it's a pretty simple one in comparison. So Marx asks, is there anything that allows an expansion of circulating exchange value in a circular economy, if not labor? And Schumpeter answers, yes. Bank credit penetrates into the transaction of the circular flow. So Schumpeter argues that thinking of capitalism as being driven by what he called a, quote, limited reservoir of money, appropriated or accumulated in the past, is misleading in contrast, in contrast to a pre, quote, pre-capitalist exchange economy. In capitalism, quote, an ever extreme increasing stream of disposable purchasing power flows into the economy. So from this point of view, Capitalism is characterized by a con continuously growing money grid, which is a reasonable assumption about the present, whether you look at the development of narrow money within the OECD economies or global broad money to GDP. With the emergence of the capacity for credit creation, that is the ability to create deposits and therefore income in addition to already accumulated financial wealth in society, banks became able to finance deficit spending. The point of this second version of the theoretical trinity is to think of capitalism as a system in which contrast deficit spending creates new financial assets. This happens either by private banks as so-called inside money, where deficits of private actors finance surpluses, or and this might be the more important implication of the non-Marxian version of the theoretical trinity for today. These deficits are an effect of political credit spending resulting in private sector net savings. Schumpeter, in a way, leads us to a sectoral analysis of capitalism, which rests on the insight that states are by no means just entities extracting and redistributing financial value generated somewhere between production and market exchange, but rather they constantly pour financial surplus into the economy by deficit spending that expands the money grid. Some states, at least, have to be debt states all the time. 
To quote economist Kenneth Boulding, every action has two facets, public debt is private assets. It's just as true it is as funny that deficit, deficits increase our money. Marx's theoretical trinity lacks the sensitivity to account for the impact of these kind of sectoral dependencies. But as the theoretical trinity now is complete, I have only a few more sentences. Marx teaches us to think about money in its theoretical and, of course, empirical context. Theories of money are theories of capitalism and should be treated as such. With his version of capitalist dynamics driven mainly by the employing of purchasing power created somehow in the process of production, Marx's ideas surely aren't that at all. In fact, many non-Marxists too try to subsume the dynamic of the money grid under theories that imagine capitalism as an empire of ownership. But contemporary debates about money and its role within the broader framework of political economics open up fruitful paths to further inquiry that depart from this supposedly common knowledge. I believe that we should discuss the relation between these two trinities and also their historical development. These departures, however, should not be clouded by the anniversary we are celebrating today. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, Aaron, we have uh, 25 minutes for, for discussion, and uh, Christoph Deutschmann is the <laughs> first, but uh, please raise your hands that I can write down who would... Uh... Thank you very much for your uh, paper. Uh, I just want, want to uh, pick up your last point, surplus, and your, uh, you, uh, what you said about Schumpeter. I think you missed one step in, uh, in Schumpeter's argument. Where does the surplus come from? Of course, uh, credit is, an, is a key point. For some additional uh, additional keystroke credit, uh, created credit. But uh, the, the, another point is, but uh, before, before credit comes another point, that is new combinations. What the, uh, what the, what the emperor first tries to do is to invent something, to, to, to new products, new technologies, new ways of uh, market, ma ma no, new networks, new, new ways of combining organization. And, of course, he wants to sell all this with profits, and for selling this with, with profits, he expects uh, expansion of demand, and this expansion of demand can also only come from uh, additional credit. So credit is not the only source underlying capitalist dynamics and surplus. But what we have to do here with this, just as Axel Paul in the, said in the last discussion, we have two, level, two levels of social, uh, socially constructed realities. The first one is the social, uh, socially constructed reality of creative destruction of new combinations, of new technologies, no? new products, and so on. And the second one is the social, socially constructed reality of credit. And both m must uh, somehow fit to e each other and obviously, nobody knows uh, whether, in advance, whether they can fit. In, in most cases, they do, do, uh, normally they do not fit to each other. This equilibrium will become apparent only ex post. This is, uh, this is simply the point. But I think you somewhat exaggerated the role of credit, of money. Please. Well, yeah, thank you. I mean, I didn't want to talk about new combinations because this is what we talk, always talk about when you talk about Schumpeter. Um, so, in, in his but in his theory, and this is this is really interesting. What strikes me about the reception of Schumpeter is the the entrepreneur and making new combinations is is a figure that gets possible because of credit creation and precisely because of the ability of the banking system to generate uh, to to allow someone to have more income than he spends. 
And th th this comes before new combination and, and, um, and uh, entrepreneurs in the theory. But th my, my point was just to use Schumpeter here to see that one problem we have with the question of where do, where do profits come from, which is the title of a, of a um, piece in the, in the Mittelweg 36 we had from Wolfgang Knudis. And one answer Schumpeter offers, and we, my, we, you, you could have done it with Keynes much more clearly, but it's, it's the point to, to contrast here Schumpeter to use someone who is specifically tied to a specific um, tradition to think about money, is constant growth of purchasing power within capitalism, which is available to be appropriated by the few. So th this doesn't mean that, that a single credit has to work out, has to be repaid, but that the economy is is, is, there's a constant stream of new purchasing power flowing into the economy that can be appropriated. This is. Herr mm. Herr Strich. Do I need this? Yes. Yes. You need the machine. Um, the looking at this, Aaron, and, and I'm, I must say, I, I was I was uh, really very impressed with your. <laughs> With, with the sort of uh, conceptual uh, order and framework that you put on all this. If I, if I look at this last slide, yeah? Yeah. now this, the following idea comes up. Uh, if people knew that the right-hand side seen from here was what it is, they would lose all confidence in the system. So they have to believe that the world functions according to the left-hand side because, because the moment they, they are disabused of this illusion, they will become very, very nervous. Yeah? And, and the interesting thing is that we have to sort of cultivate, or we, uh, the powers that be, have to sort of cultivate this sort of underdeveloped uh, uh, understanding of our world. Like, like we talk about relativity theory is here and traditional mechanics is here. And, and we have to make sure that people believe in traditional mechanics because otherwise they become too confused. <laughs> just, uh, just one word about this. There's a wonderful paper, discussion paper in our institute by Benjamin Braun on exactly this point oh yeah. on central yeah. bank communication and how they deliberately yeah, tell yeah. a wrong story about yeah. money for this purpose. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, please, go ahead. Yeah. But Th this is re really would be really interesting because th this is what we have to sort out when we when we structure our analysis an analysis of the capitalism to see well is this really one thing how it works and one thing how we, we the the legitimation works like Benjamin described or is it or is it, or do they do they um, have different relationship in different historic periods yeah, yeah, yeah. or do they but intersect today in some way? Right, right. But what, what I'm really interested in a way, in, of, uh, in a theoretical way, is w you, you can start in such a trinity from every direction. If, if you start from labor, if you are a Marxist, start with labor, you come to a diff very different story of that. And then you can capture, I think, probably the, the role of state debt for the expansion of, of private sector surplus is, is, is something you can't really describe when you, when you start from there. And when you start from a heterodox theory of money, you come to a very different story which isn't the whole story of course but but i think this is this kind of sensitivity for what theories of money do to my framework of capitalism which is of course always not the full story but it's very i think it's very important to 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 discuss where to start in, in where to start in these frameworks axel paul I have a question concerning um, the periods uh, we can identify uh, in the history of, of capitalism. Uh, if we subscribe to Schumpeter, as you do, uh, and uh, uh, assume that capitalism starts the moment uh, we have something like a bank creation uh, of credit in, in medieval uh, Europe and, and Venetian banking in the 14th century, um, I assume, too, that, that you subscribe to the not a theory, but, but observation uh, that uh, the invention of national banks has been the central boost to universalize uh, practices uh, between merchants uh, to practices of the whole population um, after the, the English financial revolution. 
Uh, but my question concerns the boost of financial capitalism we are observing today since the 1980s. Uh, since I have read your book, I, I assume I, I know your answer, but it makes a difference uh, <coughs> reading a whole chapter or <laughs> asking for a short, <laughs> concise uh, 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 answer now. What, to your opinion, um, is the configuration, the political configuration, or which are the economic incentives um, that turned capitalism, not essentially, not ontologically, uh, but uh, phenomenologically, into financial capitalism uh, which we can observe uh, since a couple of decades. I, I think we, we have a lot, lot of stories to, to, to tell this period of time. I'll try, try, to, try, to, try to mention some. I'm, there is, I think, I will start uh, telling the story with the beginning of the spread of deposits, which is, it, if you are from my age, you can't, uh, you can't imagine this, that um, you, you got a, a paycheck in a, in a, in a in a piece of paper, you got your, your, your money in cash, yeah, yeah. Uh, not so long ago. So this is the first one, but of course we will talk about um, uh, deregulation and liberalization of, of, of potential. I mean, the, the, the structural argument is you, all you need is potential borrowers and cred creditworthy borrowers. And the potential for creditworthy borrowers or, or borrowers that, that are deemed creditworthy by the banking system expanded tremendously. And this, this uh, whole bunch of stuff we know from research from the Max Planck and others um, started this. So this, the, the potential for the system expanded enormously. So it's a contingency, you would say? Yeah. No, that's a yeah. problem. It's a continuity. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 uh, the, 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 the risk horizon becomes ever more expanded with ever new uh, techniques of risk pooling and risk management. Mm -hmm. But the curves rising. Yeah. <coughs> and, and I'm wondering, is it, is, it still, is it only continuity, or which factors can we identify uh, that account for mm. uh, the exponential rise mm. of, of the curve? I mean, the Schumpetering argument where they invented this stuff some, somewhere in the 12th, 14th, whenever century, it was empirically very limited effects, but after that, you have a capitalism which needs constant growing money supply to be appropriate by the few. So maybe you, I'm, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> if I have my difficulties with, with kind of theories, I would always say, well, I read Streak and then <laughs> say, well, it's not that contingent, obviously, but, um, but I, I don't know if it's, it can be derived from what I've said. So I have, can't formulate a very strong own position here right now. So I have next, and Eva. You need this because otherwise it cannot be heard in the virtual world. Um, yeah, um, okay. Um, the, the question uh, has already been taken, unfortunately, by, by Christoph Deutschmann to some degree. Um, however, I, I would also actually tend to insist that you can't really think about credit in the Schumpeterian scheme without thinking of technological and organizational innovation. I think that's, that's actually quite evident. Um, however, adding to that, the, the point seems to be that, that Schumpeter is quite clear in business cycles that the Marxian relationship between capitalist and laborer in the Marxian scheme of capitalism, according to Schumpeter, might be replaced by the key social relationship between capitalist and entrepreneur. Well, the capitalist as the credit creator who lends credit money to the entrepreneur who then um, proceeds with the introduction of innovations. And those innovations are the source of, of uh, innovation profits or temporary rents in a sense, right? Um, so that the scheme of surplus value capitalist labor relations or whatever is transformed in a Schumpeterian sense to a scheme of capital credit um, or credit as capital being transferred to the, to the entrepreneur who then proceeds with innovation. Um, and the entrepreneur capitalist relationship becomes the key social relationship in, in capitalism, relationship of power, conflict, power struggles and so on. It's, it's quite uh, repeatedly mentioned in business cycles. So how would you comment on that? because I don't think it might be part of your, of your scheme here. 
How would you comment on that, given the impression that Schumpeter's scheme only holds for 19th century competitive capitalism, when in 20th century monopolistic capitalism, as Schumpeter points out in, in Capitalism, Socialism, Democracy, um, the role of credit creation by banks and so on is in a sense being, being diminished due to the, among others, capability of, of large corporations to use internal savings for refinancing their innovative efforts. So therefore, the relationship between those large corporations and, and the banking sector also changes. And I mean, given the fact that we're in the 21st century and now we have financialization, financial markets and so on, once more, I think we, we might see massive transformations in this scheme of credit creation and innovation. Speaking of financial innovations, for instance, which do not exist in the Schumpeterian way of thinking, which, because they didn't exist in his days, but which are preeminent in our days. So I think something perhaps to add to your, to your presentation here. Thank you. I mean, obviously, I haven't, I haven't used Marx's historic analysis, um, so I can't put Schumpeter against it now. I just, just, um, I just want, wanted to um, put these two different perspectives on the whole present, um, on, on the whole uh, phenomenon, in opposition. Um, I, 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 if, if you would ask me where would I look for a good analysis about today's economic system, I wouldn't look at Schumpeter, of course. So this is, this is what many heterodox economists do these days, what political economists do. But um, I think you can only understand the word works of, for example, modern monetary theory, but you don't have to rely on this particular theory. But um, you, you cannot understand their arguments when you start with a, within a, um, this, this way of, uh, to, um, to picture the Marxian framework. And so this is kind of an intervention not to someone who is basically into a very deep into a, sto a story based on these theories. But for, for um, my main point here is I think um, we have this Marx, uh, Marx anniversary and a lot of people say, well, we have to get to back to Marx and read Marx again. And I think with respect to money and this stuff, Marx is pretty much there. He's pretty much, of course, there every always other details, but from the general perspective, thinking of savings driving the economy, thinking of somehow about production, is very close to some form of economic discourse we, we still have present. And of course, we have to get into detail of historic analysis. You need more than that, of course. Okay, I would like to take questions together uh, now, too. Uh, we still have eight minutes' time, and I put myself on the, on the list for the first of them, and then it is Sasha with the, with the second question before you respond. So two very short uh, uh, questions that come up from, uh, from your presentation. The first one is, I mean, given the way you describe the financial system, what is the role of central banks yeah, in, I mean, this confidence game? And the second question, given the charts you showed about the dramatic increase in monetary supply and your idea that it is monetary supply which drives growth, why do we see decreasing growth rates yeah, throughout the Western industrial world? Yeah, and that connects yeah, to um, Christoph Neuschwan's question, of course. Uh, Sasha, please. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. I'd like to uh, comment on this uh, issue that you raised about distribution, so profit and rent, which is important for Schumpeter, this distinction. Um, um, because there, now what's so interesting, I think your argument fills an important gap, and that is in, in distributional in, uh, uh, direction, because um, we, if money comes from credit, this also means that there's an element of rent defined in the moment of credit given for. So that means that we are now, the financial capitalism is basically by, by bringing much money into, into existence as cr in, f in the form of credit, this means that it's already like a lot of profit, industrial profit that will be produced in the future is already transformed into rent now. It will be a rent payment when it occurs. I mean, if there's no crisis, of course, but then, then it will be possible to, to pay this back in rent. So this, and maybe we could, from your perspective, we could understand financial capitalism as, as, a, as, as a 
period of capitalism where we have uh, pre-transformed a lot of what Schumpeter would call profit into rent payments that later, that later on will have a special, so we, we pre-shape the distributional patterns with it. And maybe that's, I, I think that would be a, a good way to go on with the, with the financial capitalism debate. Okay, that's your turn. Yeah, thank you. Um, the role of central banks was, I, I just had, had one sentence on them because I was told I have 30 minutes max and then the microphone. You did well off. in terms of <laughs> yeah. I, 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 was, I was drilled to do. So. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> so, so, so I just mentioned that um, I would think about, in, in, in Keynesian terms basically, about central banks fulfilling a certain role. And the role within the last years in Europe was um, not creating money to 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 create growth, not creating money for for for, for governments to to build bridges or something. This is this is one role. So, for how do we use the political facilities for money creation? Is one role of central bank, and and the whole shift of central bank independence means we use it driven by the by the demand of, of private actors. Yeah. This is this is one way way. Um, to use it. The, the other way is the, the maybe equally important um, role of central banks is, is covered what, what Benjamin Brown does, for example. So they ob obviously play a role in, in, in shaping returns um, in, in, in by, by setting interest and so on, by trying to influence long-term interest rates with, with quantitative easing and, and so on. So much more, uh, th this I would say is, is um, the scope and this is, this is of course f tremendously important but it seems as if I would like downplay it by, by talking about other bands but th this is just, just um, not, was just not my intention. Um, I, I have a second bullet point with no, nothing in so I maybe not have noted your second point but why, I will why talk about growth. If, if there's so much money why are there such low growth rates? Growth rate. Okay, then I, then I just made three points. And okay. um, the, the answer is pretty pretty simple, I guess. I mean, one one of my basic arguments, and this relates to to what, what Sasha asked about distribution, is we have, and this with, this relates to to growth. We have this this idea um, that we have somehow markets who di distribute assets, and they do it quite inequality. So they create inequality, and we have state forces redistributing it, but markets we would describe as people selling titles to property, property owners exchanging. So if, if we start with that, we would at least account for the effects of credit creation additionally to, to that. To say these are these these form of <coughs> rents maybe these form of <coughs> well income created through the privilege of money creation is a single force, uh, additional force, even when it comes to inequality, and this is the point with growth. We, we don't need growth to make capitalists richer. We, we need income, and this is what 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 we generate. This, this is the whole point of of Schumpeter leading, in my view, <laughs> to sectoral analysis. So they can they can appropriate purchasing power that is thrown into the system without creating growth because it's created for um, mm. assets, for the purchase of assets. Mm. Yes. The rent taking, the rent -taking <laughs> explains the lack of growth. I think you gave yeah. the answer to that question. So this is one way to, to de describe it because it's an it's, it's additional source of purchasing power which is constantly used to expand the money supply but doesn't, well, um, doesn't cause growth because it is not channeled to something that would we count as, as a growing um, economy. But th this is not, th th this could very easily be, be changed, by the way, by, by um, states using their facilities, but this is another. Okay, shall we go on? That was, yeah. And be this will be my more, answer to rent. Two, two, <laughs> two more, so you can then answer a little bit to Sasha. You're the next. Yeah. Yeah, if I can remember what I was going to say, it, it seems to me that uh, 
what you're saying is is not that credit is the only source of profit. It's a kind of additional source of profit because there's still production there. You know, if, uh, and that's the you know, why there's no growth. Well, this it's additional credit is not a, resulting in additional production. It's a resulting in you know inflation and prices of, of the things that the rich people are in, are, are well of asset prices, right? Um, but you know, ideally, if there were growth, that this injection of additional purchasing, purchasing power would correspond to additional production of stuff that's useful, and people would be buying more of it. But there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. I mean, I'm thinking of the Brazilian economy in the, the 1980s. Well, but Brazilian banks are some of the most advanced in the world because they're so used to dealing with hyperinflation and state financing. So you have all kinds of credit and state deficit spending that doesn't result in more production. It just results in hyperinflation and the diversion of capital from production into state financing because it's more profitable to buy state debt than to, than to invest in, in producing stuff. So the, a lot depends on the context and, you know, or, or um, people buy things, but they buy things that are produced in other countries. Lisa Knoll, last question. Welcome. Thank you, Aaron. I would like you to of the limit of the seemingly unlimited system. So you, you were um, so just uh, the, in the last couple of months, you could observe that insurances and banks they. They uh, refrain from um, produ um, giving out new products because they cannot refinance their products, like insurances, like house, uh, what all, all uh, plenty of products that that normal people usually buy from banks and insurances. So banks draw back from this business. So how does this indicate a limit or a kind of a decommodification of a seemingly limitless uh, system we are we are facing? And how ca can you? Also, um, see, see, or, or explain this this uh, reverse reverse trend in in the in the story that you told us, or is this still a going on story, limited and can be solved by the system itself by keystrokes, more, more keystrokes? Okay, final response. Final response. So, Carl, um, I mean, what what I find really interesting in this Marxian quote I showed is that he doesn't ask how actors, how households. Be, are, became profitable. This is not a microscopic question. This is the microscopic question that, that he thinks, okay, in my model, capitalists are the only one owning mon having money. This is a model, of course, right? And he says, if, if capitalists are the only one owning money, how can it be that they as a class have in the end of the cycle more than before? And this is his whole point. This is his critique of classical economics in this sense. It's, this is not a zero-sum game. They have more in, as a class. And it's, it's, well, it has to come from labor. I don't have another idea. And Schumpeter says, well, no, there's, every cycle has more money, and it's not, they, they can appropriate these as profits before it gets devaluated or whatever. So this is, this is really a macroscopic answer to a problem Marx has, and he says, I have no other answer than this. And I would say, well, of course, is an industry and production a way to make profits for a firm? But it's no way to generate more income in an economy as total. This needs to be done by deficits. Someone needs to run deficits. And this has ultimately be the state if you want a private sector surplus. Um, and this is just, I, one, one, my point was just very modest to show that this, this, this short quote by Schumpeter answers to a whole big part of Marx's um, theoretical framework with another idea that we are discussing r right now in various forms in political economy. Um, but of, of course, this is, as, again, this is not the whole story, and you have to tell different stories for countries who, who run into foreign debt versus countries who are monetary sovereign, um, indebt them themselves by, at their own central bank, and so on. This, no doubt. Um, constraint. But, uh, what, what I find really interesting is when, when you talk about money creation, the, the, this issue of but there are constraints, it's very pressing. And I understand that because it, it seems, if we want to apply what, well, why don't we have 
twice as much money if they can create it. Right? So, of course not. The, the, the point is to say it, it is mainly constrained by, um, by calculations of profitability. So they don't have things that you have to do risk calculations and profitability calculations, and they have to match somehow. This is what you get when you, when you um, uh, put profit-oriented actors in charge of your money growth. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, there, 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 there are two information I, I want to convey. First of all, there is coffee not only on this floor here, but also one floor up. Yeah, and that means there's more space for for each individual if you distribute over larger spaces.